Welcome again, uh, Liberating Faith students, uh, Amy, uh, Sunday school, school students. Today is lesson nine, April 30th, 2023. Uh, a promise is made to Jesus' disciples. Lesson scripture today is Acts 1, uh, 1 through 11. And the key verse, to, and, and the focus scriptures are the same. The key verse, you will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come up on you. And I'm gonna read, I want to read some verses for you real quick so we can kind of uh, get the rhythm of what's going on here. Acts chapter one, uh, begin at verse one. In the first book, Theopolis, I wrote all the things that Jesus taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions uh, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Is isn't it interesting? And I was saying to you last week in last week's lesson, saints, uh, about grabbing the bigger picture from other parts of the, the text in order to get this bigger thought from the mind of God. And if you remember, because I'm not just here to read Sunday school lesson to you and apply it. I'm, I won't. I, it's my heart's desire to teach you how to look at the word of God yourself as well and stop depending on so many different people. Uh, to always communicate things to you. The Bible says he'll give liberally to all who ask. Uh, Jesus, uh, seeking ye shall find, knock in the door, uh, shall be open. Now we all have you know, different giftings, I get that. But remember last week what we talked about was that this, uh, the lesson with respect to Jesus reinstates Peter, um, that was just a flawed premise. And I explained to you why in last week's lesson. I don't want to explain to you why, but that was the title of the lesson. It was a flawed premise. I told you why. Uh, any of you teach these PhDs, church pastors, bishops, whoever you are, get a, you, you seen the video, go to last week's video, uh, which would have been uh, April 23rd. And I want you to put a comment in the section and uh, give me your email address and let's get together and let's discuss that because Jesus reinstates Peter is that's a flawed premise. That's not what happened there. But those things happen because, again, people ask you through this so-called exegeting process, expository teaching, whatever that means. To describe a room in a house without describing the house that's built around the room, if you will. And if you just focus on one verse and even one chapter, uh-uh, you have to see the wider picture from the word of God or things like last week happen. But when we get into this week and I said it and I ain't taking it back. Uh, and yes, I have advanced biblical education. So, and I'm a Christian apologist. I'd love to hammer this out with any of you. So, uh, so when we talk about this and we talk about um, Jesus uh, appearing to people 40 days, as it said here, do you at all find it interesting? Now we're stepping out to see this wider picture from the mind of God. Is it a coincidence that before he began his ministry, he spent 40 days in the wilderness to represent 40 years? I get it from the from the uh, exodus from for Hebrews spending in there to prepare himself to go to that place of promise and to be the promise to the entire world. I get it. I get it. But is that a coincidence that he spent 40 days at the beginning of his ministry in the wilderness? That's when Satan came to tempt him. And then after his resurrection, he spent like these days, 40 days as well. No. Again, saints, grab the picture, the big picture from the mind of God. Stop letting these people fool you, man. I don't care. Bishop, pastor, national bishop, president convention. I don't care who they are. Stop letting these people fool you, man. This thing is so fine tuned. And when God said, uh, when the Bible tells us, even the hairs on your head are number, there's no detail too small for God. That is why to see it. Some of y'all studying Greek and Hebrew, thinking you're going to better understand God's word. And that's not true. You know, I, we can talk about that too. I uh, get on, go on my profile here or whenever you find this and you'll see a video where I destroyed that, that fake argument as if God isn't sufficient enough in the, in the language I speak in to tell me what he needs to tell me. People that say you need to know Greek and Hebrew to better understand God's word are in effect saying God is insufficient and you were insufficiently created in a, in wherever language you were born into. And not only that, they do not know. They, they fail to answer the largest question from the two largest linguistic events in the scripture is the Tower of Babel as well as Pentecost. I'm gonna leave that alone. But it would be better for you to see the bigger picture from the mind of God in the language you speak rather than running around acting like some educated fool. Amen. So uh, key terms. This is important today. The Greek word baptized means plunge, immerse, sink, hence to wash, to be immersed, turn from the old life to a new life, uh, to a life free of sin. Baptizing the spirit indicates an outward sign of an internal reality of joining the Holy Spirit. I want to deal with this as well, because this was something that I needed uh, some time ago needed to be delivered from as well doctrinally. 
right? And I, I went into, uh, I went into a debate, uh, with some brothers, uh, uh because my, uh, even trying to see the big picture from the right mind of God, looking at these on the cross, et cetera, et cetera, out, uh, that didn't get baptized, but yet were still saved and et cetera, et cetera. But what we have to understand here, saints, is baptism is not simply an outward expression of your inward faith. That's not what that is. It has to be done to fulfill righteousness. We know that because Jesus even went to John the Baptist and, he, and John the Baptist said, Lord, I have need to be baptized of you and you're coming to me. Jesus said this has to happen to fulfill righteousness. Right. So and even in John chapter one through three, there are pe the, uh, the, the, the theologians that I now push back against. They say, well, it says just believe on Jesus here uh, to receive salvation or, or, you know, to receive grace through faith, this and that. I said, but you got to read the first five verses because it talks about uh, uh, water. It talks about the water, et cetera, et cetera. Ah. So I'm saying that uh, saints to realize that I love this description here. Baptizing the spirits so on baptizing the water, come up full, full of the Holy Ghost, baptizing the spirit, right? Those two things work together. So I want you all to understand that uh, is that if I step up and I push back against you know fault, well, uh, flawed doctrine, I receive the same as well from time to time. It, it isn't often. Once every five, six, seven, eight years, it isn't often. But we need to be open to have our understanding expanded, right? The dwelling of God, as well as other angels and chosen discreets, and this is the scripture of heaven, is often conceived as an expanse that overarches the earth, also refers to spiritual heaven and spiritual realm, a level of existence higher than outside physical introduction. So the introduction, there are times when family and friends gather for holidays, weddings, and other special occasions. Moments like those are often considered the best memories of our lives. These occasions are so full of joy that no one wants them to end. They inspire commitments to never be apart and rejoin again soon. It wasn't an experience of mine, but these moments motivate everyone to do whatever it takes to recapture these experiences again. The beginning verse, verses of the books of Acts document how the disciples must have felt when they realized their moments of joy with Jesus were coming to an end. He would no longer be with them as he had been before in a physical state. And I'm going to knock off right there. And I want to encourage you all, then uh, this is just, uh, brought into my spirit. I want to encourage you all that your time with Jesus, the, the Holy Spirit anyway, will never, uh, as long as you're saved, that, that time's going to come to an end, even when it seems that the Spirit's quiet. But I, I want to especially speak to those of you, uh, younger ministers, uh, younger uh, missionaries, younger, uh, just younger people in general, uh, as well as some of you older people, which we we have a harder time breaking habits, bad habits, unbiblical habits. I said something uh, to young ministers uh, on a street preaching video some time ago, and it seems to have caused it. Well, it caused a stir. And what I said to them, I repeat, I, I said, young ministers, you need to sit, stop sitting under some old head like me. For five, 10, 15 years dying on the vine, hoping that you get fourth or fifth Sunday preaching scraps or scraps when uh, the pastor isn't out of town. He'll throw you a bone when he's out of town or he ain't got time to preach or whatever it is that he got going on. And you need to get out there and you need to plant a ministry and you need to go forward and do what you were called to do. Cause the stir. And I went further to say, stop letting old heads pimp your gifts. And I say pimp, not in a blasphemous way. I say pimp in that exploiting somebody's gifts beyond the time that God would have you develop them. There's a difference in exploiting somebody and God allowing you to sucker off their gifts to build the ministry that he's put you ahead of, at the head of. It could be a, a male course, could be a choir, music ministry. It could be here. It could be whatever. But I'm saying that to point out that these people, these decide the time with Jesus, the time of their training was coming to it. Now, the spirit would always train, but the time with the master or their master teacher had come to an end. And I'm telling you in the name of Jesus Christ today, young ministers, you that will see this, you are going to answer for your wasted time and your wasted ministry opportunities. You're not going to be able to tell God that you sat under some, some old head like me, some church pastor or bishop or whoever that is 
for years because you was being obedient to the man of God. The Bible says, do I seek to please men or God? If I don't seek to please, uh, if I seek to please men, I shall not be the servant of Christ. That's what the word of God says. And you're seeking to please your pastor. There's a time when you can be obedient to people like me and become disobedient to God. That is when I was a, when I was a boy, we used to like to sneak into pe people's orchard and, and pick apples right here in this city. And, and oftentimes we get the apples that were right. And it was time for them things to pick and come off that tree and feed somebody. Then there were these other apples that remained up there because they they matured at a different pace than the apples around them. And they had spoiled right on that tree. They hit the ground and they died. So what I'm saying to you is most of you who see this young ministers or ministers in general, my age as well, sitting under some pastor waiting for some scraps. You have spoiled on the tree. You have spoiled those of you even leading other ministries, choirs, etc., etc., assistant directors. You spoiled on the vine waiting for something that is not or may not ever happen. And especially for you teachers of God's word, you're telling me God called you to preach. Okay, Jesus' disciples were with him three years. Your father in the ministry, you always bragging about how gifted he is, the bishop, your regional bishop, how gifted he is. And he's so gifted that you've been under him five, six, seven years, and you still don't know what you need to know to go out and do what God's called you to do. They were with Jesus for three years. These were young men. And then they went, and then Jesus sent them out with what he gave them, right? Your father in the ministry so tight, so gifted. That you got to sit up under 10, 15 years. So you're telling me God gave you a gift to preach. And let's just say we preach once a week. Not that that's all we should do. You know, but let's just say 52. Let's just say 50. The nice round number. 50 weeks in a year. You're telling me out of seven years, 350 opportunities to preach. Eat, and, and you could triple that if you out witness the street preaching, hand out tracts and these other ministry opportunities. Let's just say that that number nicely in seven years is 350 opportunities to stand up in front of people to preach the gospel. And let's just say uh, you got out of seven years, you got 20 of those times to share the gospel. Four Sundays, fifth Sundays, pass out of town. You're telling me the Holy Spirit instructed you to sit there with the gifts that God has given you and let whatever he's put into you die on the vine like that apple. Because it's past its time of maturing. God told you that. Uh, Luke was known to be a physician. Is also credited for authoring the gospel that bears his name. The opening verses indicate that this is a second correspondence to Theopolis. Who was a recipient of Luke's gospel. The gospel is strategically connected to the book of Acts. Since it states the occurrence of the ascension of Christ. And the promise uh, to his disciples. Maybe. But again, we don't know. If it's connected. We don't know who wrote it. Uh, and yeah, even with the Gospels, y'all really need to uh, y'all need to really look into that. The text intentionally mentions that the encounters with the risen Lord occurred between his resurrection and ascension over a period of 40 days. This indicates that his disciples and others offer consistent evidence over the time of Jesus physical resurrection. During this period, the text reveals that there were still inquiries about the restoration of Israel's kingdom. Again, Jesus reminds them that they had no need to know such things. Instead, their focus must be on their assignment. And I'll end there uh, before uh, going to the. Uh, life app, uh, life application and uh, we'll get out of your way here. Saints, there's some things that you just need to take by faith. Jesus told his own disciples, you don't need to know that. You just go and do what I tell you to do. So again, when we talk about your time of maturity, and I can't set a number on that, quite frankly. So I said that to point out is that you don't need to see the end. Jesus' disciples didn't need to see the end of the mission or what Jesus was going to do to carry out their part. You don't need to know once you are mature, whatever that is for you. And there are others that are assigned to be servants of the man of God their whole life. I was totally prepared to do that. And my prayer was that I could remain as such personally. And I'll share that. I haven't told anybody that before. But my prayer was that I could just remain a sidekick to the man of God. Because seeing what they go through, it's like, man, I don't want to deal with all that, man. Because I'm much more aggressive, you know. But when your time comes... You don't want to drop to the ground like that spoiled fruit, that spoiled apple and die. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to pick you and take you somewhere to feed somebody else, if you will. Don't allow distractions about other things that are going on and other things that you wonder about to freeze you in place. A lot of people uh, freeze in place because their faith won't let them move forward unless they know what God is doing. 
And we don't need to be those people. In a life application finding on any given Sunday, the faith of Christian believers will be tested uh, on any given day. Increasing gun violence, wars and threats of wars, health threats and disparities and underlying racial division and cultural insensitivity are just uh, a few of the hazards of the black and brown uh, communities. The Bible informs us that although the world is in chaos, God is still in control. Those who believe in the saving grace of Jesus will receive power to overcome these threats. That power comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not only provides strength and courage, but it also equips believers with the gift of wisdom, healing, discernment, and more. And finally, saints, as I close here today, who did God call you to be? What did he call you to do? And are you talking to God? about a time of mature, uh, a time of departing and doing what he's called you to do. Remember, even Solomon said, for everything there's a season, he went on to say there's a time to plant you, like where you are, and a time to pluck up that very thing that was planted. Don't allow your roots to grow too long in the ground, saints, because at the end of the day, there's somebody that needs to hear from you. There's a ministry that you need to plant wherever you need to plant it. Don't sit under people like me and die on the vine, a choir, a choir director, a music ministry, uh, a, a usher ministry, whatever that thing is, a woman's society, a missional society. What other things that, what is it specifically that God brought you in the world to do? He did not bring you into the world to sit up under somebody else, else with your gift itself your whole life and die on the vine. So be it.